Good morning. I would like to introduce Professor Patrick Ratchford, who's going to introduce our first speaker this morning. Patrick? So, good morning. Uh, in 1990, I was a member of this quaint little thing called the Book of the Month Club. This was the pre-Amazon.com era. And one month that year, one of the featured titles was a book called Journey Through Genius, The Great Theorems of Mathematics by our speaker this morning, William Dunham. It's kind of a rare thing for a mathematics book to be one of the featured titles in the Book of the Month Club. So I was intrigued, and when I received the book, I discovered that it, I understood why they picked it. It is a really masterful exposition of some interesting moments in the history of mathematics. Its target is a general audience. And I really encourage anybody that's interested to pick up a copy out in the uh, lobby when, when you get a chance. Over the next decade, I got a chance to see Bill give uh, talks at various professional conferences on the history of mathematics. And I discovered that in addition to being a wonderful writer, he was a wonderful speaker. So in the early 2000s, when I began teaching at Cedar Crest College down in Allentown, I was very happy to discover that across the park and up the hill from me, Bill was the Truman Kohler Professor of Mathematics at Muhlenberg. Uh, he graciously allowed me to sit in on one of his history courses uh, one semester, and after that I kept shoving some of my students up the hill to take his course whenever I could convince them to make the trek, and they all spoke very highly of it. So in addition to being a good writer and a good speaker, he's a wonderful classroom teacher. So I know we're in for a, a treat this morning. Uh, I'll give you some of the nuts and bolts of his uh, biography. His undergraduate degree was from the University of Pittsburgh. He has a master's degree and a PhD from The Ohio State University. Uh, before teaching at Muhlenberg, he taught at Hanover College in Indiana. Uh, he followed up this book with three additional books, uh, The Mathematical Universe, Euler, The Master of Us All, and The Calculus Gallery. He's the author of numerous journal articles on the history of mathematics, uh, and the editor of a couple of collections of articles of other people on the history of mathematics, re recipient of awards for teaching and writing from the Mathematical Association of America. Uh, following retiring from Muhlenberg College, he's had visiting positions at Harvard, Princeton, University of Penn, and Cornell. And currently, he and his wife Penny are down the other end of the Northeast Extension from us at Bryn Mawr College. Uh, where they are research associates. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure on behalf of the gathering to welcome to the stage William Dunham to teach us about theorems as mathematics. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we could just move this over here a bit. Okay. Okay. I want to pull out the plug, though. No, we're okay. Okay. Well, th thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here at the gathering to talk about truth in its various incarnations. One of these is mathematical truth, and that will be my topic this morning. In my discipline, truth has a pretty solid meaning. As we heard yesterday, it sometimes can be a slippery topic, but in mathematics, we can establish truth by proving things in a logically rigorous fashion. And before we leave here this morning, I will prove some things for you. Um, these things are called theorems, and they are the coin of the realm of mathematics. And there are plenty of them, and some of them are really great. And I'm going to share with you a few of the really great theorems, the masterpieces of our discipline. These are like you know, a sh the great uh, play of Shakespeare, a great novel of Jane Austen, except they're mathematical results. So here is a theorem. You've probably heard about this one. You might remember the Pythagorean theorem uh, in geometry. It says this, in a right triangle, the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So you've all seen this at some point. Right? A right triangle is one of these. It's a triangle with a square corner, a right angle. And the hypotenuse, you remember, is the long side opposite the right angle which sounds like hippopotamus, and there's lots of jokes about that. We all remember. But, um, so this says that the square on the hypotenuse, c squared, and you remember this little exponent. This just means c times c equals a squared plus b squared. So that's a great theorem. That's one of the greatest, the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'm going to show you a proof of this. We're going to prove this and see, see if you believe that. 
But uh, the uh, theorem dates back at least to Euclid's elements, where you will find that is the 47th proposition of book one. And what I want to stress about Euclid's elements is that book was written 300 BCE. That's a very long time ago. Now, if you think about Greek medicine in 300 BC, you would not want that medicine applied to you today in the hospital. That would, that's been replaced. If you think of Greek astronomy, you know, if that's all we had, we would never have gotten to the moon. But Greek mathematics is still good. The Pythagorean theorem is still rock solid. It's used all the time. Why? Well, it was proved. Its truth was established as a great theorem with the incontrovertible rules of logic. That's what makes mathematics so neat. Um, it, it lasts forever. A theorem once proved is a theorem always proved. Oliver Heaviside put it this way, logic, he said, can be patient because it is eternal. And, the, and if you like mathematics, that's one of the things about it, I think, that's so attractive, its eternal nature. And let me quote Bertrand Russell, one of my favorite mathematicians, of course, a great philosopher, mathematician, social critic, and winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. This is the first and I predict last time a mathematician will win <laughs> the Nobel Prize for Literature. But here's what Russell said. He was writing to an American friend in 1901. He says, to me, pure mathematics is one of the highest forms of art. It has a sublimity quite special to itself and an immense dignity derived from the fact that its world is exempt from change and time. I am quite serious about this. Mathematics is the only thing we know of that is capable of perfection. In thinking about it, we become gods. So for the next 40 minutes, we're going to become gods and think about, <laughs> think about mathematics. Now, I want to make three little statements before I plunge in. First, uh, I'll keep the math content very low because, I mean, we've all seen algebra and geometry, but it's been in high school, and my guess is I'm not the only one that's been decades out of high school. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll try not to make this too complicated. I hope everybody can follow everything. Second, although I will establish truth, it should be noted that this is truth about mathematics, which is a very limited vocabulary, a very limited corner of, of human existence. So the truth of, about gr art and justice and beauty is not, what, not the kind of truth that mathematicians work on. They work on prime numbers and triangles and a very limited sort of uh, vocabulary. But within that little restricted world, we can establish truth, uh, eternal truth. And then third, Gino asked if there will be a quiz at the end of this. And the answer is yes, there will. But only he will have to take it. So. So. No, there won't be a quiz. OK, now, a theorem tends to have the, this form. It says, if A, then B. That tends to be the structure of this. If you have this hypothesis, then this conclusion follows. And you try to demonstrate that mathematically. Mathematicians have two ways to attack proving such a thing. And the first, not surprisingly, is called the direct proof. If I want to go, if I want to show if A then B, the direct proof says, well, we'll just reason in that direction. We'll assume the hypothesis and get a conclusion, 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 conclusion until we reach the B, the thing we're trying to prove, a direct attack. Now, there's another way to prove theorems, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But let me give an example of a direct proof, just so we've seen one. And my example is going to come from the domain of what mathematicians call number theory. That sounds kind of highfalutin, but it's just a, the study of the whole numbers, the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, the first numbers you learn in elementary school. Later, you learn negative numbers and fractions and their rational numbers and all these other more sophisticated number systems, but that's not what this is about. Just think one, two, three, four, whole numbers. Okay. Here's my theorem. First theorem we're going to prove this morning. It says if the whole number m is a perfect square, then so is m plus m plus m plus m. Now, first question, what's a perfect square? Well, you, you probably remember this, but it's when you take a whole number and multiply it by itself, multiply it by itself, you get a perfect square. So 
3 times 3 is 9. That's a perfect square. 4 times 4 is 16. Now, I'm not adding. I'm multiplying. 16 is a perfect square. 5 times 5, 25 is a perfect square. OK, so what this is saying is if you have such a number, m, and you take it plus itself plus itself plus itself, the result is yet another one of these perfect squares. If, then. Okay. Um, well, now, if you were given this, you might say, well, let's try it. Let's, 9, that was a perfect square, right? 3 times 3. So if m were 9, then m plus m plus m plus m is 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, and 9 is 18, 36. Perfect square? 6 times 6, right? Suppose m were 25. 5 times 5 is a perfect square. Then you'd have 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25, 100. Perfect square? 10 times 10, yeah. So you could check this for a couple of examples, and it works. But that's not a proof. You could check it for 1,000 examples. That's not a proof. Because this said any m, any perfect square. How many perfect squares are there? Infinitely many, right? 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 3 times 3. This is a statement about infinitely many things. So some people say, oh, I'll just get a computer to do this. Well, you turn on the computer, and it can check 100 billion examples. And they all work. And that proves nothing. Because if there's infinitely many numbers, and you've checked 100 billion, how many are left? Infinitely many. You haven't even started. So if I'm going to do this, I have to do this abstractly, generally, all at once for all perfect squares. And I'm going to give a direct proof of this result. So here we go, our first proof. If the whole number m is a perfect square, then so is m plus m plus m plus m. Well, I say, OK, assume m is a perfect square. Now, what's that mean? There's a meaning to that. It means it's something times something, 3 times 3, 4 times 4. But I can't specify it. So I'm going to say it's k times k, letting k be you know, whatever the number is whose square is m. But I'm not specifying it. And if I'd rather use the cool notation, that's the same as k with a little 2, the exponent. And k is some whole number. OK, so now I'm assuming m looks like k times k. It's k squared. What I have to look at is m plus m plus m plus m. So let's see, m plus m plus m plus m. Well, if m is k squared, then m plus m plus m plus m is k squared plus k squared plus k squared plus k squared. OK. Well, what's that? Well, apple plus apple plus apple plus apple is four apples. k squared plus k squared plus k squared plus k squared is four k squared. Okay, so I'm reasoning along. Now I say this, 4k squared, I'm going to write it this way, 2 times 2 times k times k. You buy that? The 4 is the 2 times 2, and the k squared is the k times k. So sure, that's the same. And now I remember that when you multiply, you can change the order. You don't have to do it in that order. So what if I write it this way? Instead of 2 times 2 times k times k, 2 times k times the other 2 times the other k. Same thing, right? But now look, group those. 2 times k times 2 times k. That's a square, something times itself. And so this is 2 times k squared. And so m plus m plus m plus m, reason, 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 comes out to be a square. And that's what it said. If, if m is a perfect square, so is m plus m plus m plus m. I got a perfect square. The proof is done. And QED is what mathematicians put when the proof is done. I'll mention that in a minute. But, but before doing so, let me notice this was a, a direct proof. It covers all perfect squares at once. It's a valid argument. And so if you have a perfect square and add it to itself four times, it, you're going to get a perfect square. And that's true in Pennsylvania this morning. <laughs> and it'll be true in Australia this morning. And it's true on Mars this morning. And it'll be true 1,000 years from now because we proved it. That's the eternal nature of proof. So somebody comes along, they say, hey, 841 is a perfect square. I wonder if 841 plus 841 plus 841 plus 841 is also a perfect square. And they start adding. I say, stop. You don't have to. It's got to be. We just proved it. And so I've covered 841 or any other perfect square you give me. You don't even have to check it. I know. It plus itself plus itself plus itself is a perfect square. Nice direct proof. QED, I should just say that is Latin for quod era demonstrandum, which means we have demonstrated, we have proved that which we put forth. So the proof is, it means that you're done. When you're reading one of these, you're glad to see that because you're not, you're done. 
All right, so that's a direct proof. But there, oh, oh no, no, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna give you an alternative proof of this, that's right, before I get to my indirect proof. I'm gonna show you that there's another way to prove this. And this is a neat thing about math. Sometimes there's different attacks. Mine I just did you, gave you was sort of an algebraic one with the little exponents and the letters. But you can do this geometrically. So same theorem. If m is a perfect square, so is m plus m plus m plus m. If m is a perfect square, what I'm gonna imagine is an actual square, you know, a geometrical square. And k will be how long each side is. And you know how to get the area of a square, is or any rectangle, base times height. So you just multiply, so the area of this is m. It's a perfect square, but I see it now visually as an area. So now if I took m plus m plus m plus m, I want four of these squares. m plus m plus m plus m. And I want to amalgamate them. I want to add them. And when I do that, instead of just seeing them, I'm going to squish them together next to each other. So here goes, ready, my visual. One, two, three, go. Go, there, OK. <laughs> here, I'll do it again. One, two, three, go, there we go. <laughs> So there's m plus m plus m plus m. And what do you notice? What is that shape? It's a square. And so if you add four squares geometrically, you can see they stack up and you get a square. So there's a different way to prove the same result with a picture. And notice, if the original square was k by k, this one is 2k by 2k, exactly as the algebra showed when we did it the first time. So, OK, so that's the, the, the theorem proved twice. Now I'm going to get to my indirect proof. This is kind of cool. You want to show that something is true if A then B. And this time you say, well, suppose A were right, but B is false. You assume that the, the conclusion you want, you say, suppose that isn't true. If from that you can reason to a contradiction, a logical absurdity, that means the assumption that the conclusion was false can't hold. It can't be false. The conclusion can't be false. Because if it were, you'd get a contradiction. And if it can't be false, that means it's true. So this way, you prove it by sort of an indirect roundabout attack. This is sometimes called a, a reductio ad absurdum, the Latin for this technique, reduction to an absurdity. So let me show you a proof that's indirect. Now, here's, here's the, the thesis again, how we're doing this. Given the hypothesis, we assume the conclusion is false and then try to get a contradiction. And I'm going to give you an example from the domain of algebra. So very elementary algebra, I promise. So here's my theorem. There is no solution to that equation. 3x plus 1 over 3x plus 2 equals 1. I'm asserting no solution. All right, now how would you do this? Well, you could let, you know, a solution means you find the number x when you put it in the slot and it works. It comes out to be 1. So you could put in x equals 3 and try it, and it doesn't come out to be 1. So 3 is not the solution. And you could put in 7, and that doesn't work. So 7 is not the solution. And if you put in 9, you don't get 1. That's not the solution. But you can't check every number. There's infinitely many. So that's not going to work. How are you going to prove there cannot be a solution here? What you're going to do is do an indirect proof, a proof by contradiction. I'm going to assume there is a solution and show that would lead me into a logical quagmire. So let's say there is a solution. Suppose there is. I'm sort of assuming exactly the opposite of what I want. Well, what is it? Well, I don't know. I'm assuming there's something. I'm just going to give it a name. Call it A. Whatever it is, we'll call it A. If that's a solution, you can stick it in that equation. So instead of 3x plus 1 over 3x plus 2 equals 1, you put in the A, and you know the 3a plus 1 over 3a plus 2 is 1. Okay, so that would follow if there's a solution. Now, here's a fraction equaling 1. Now, now you think about that. When does that happen? When does a fraction equal 1? Well, if it was like 8 sevenths, that's not 1. It's top heavy. If it was 7 eighths, that's, that's not 1. The only way you can get 1 is if it were 8 eighths or 9 ninths. And then, you know, you could cancel 10. In other words, the top has to be exactly equal to the bottom for this to come out to be 1. So if that's 1, I conclude that 3a plus 1, the top, has to be 3a plus 2. That's the only way you get that to be 1. Hmm. Now, you remember in algebra, you can cancel stuff, take the same thing away from each side, take away the 3a. And what follows? What's left? 1 equals 2. That's a ridiculous. 1 does not equal 2. That's an absurdity. I reduced it to an absurdity. 
1 equals 2 is false. And hence, something's wrong here. And the trouble was this initial assumption. When I assumed there was a solution, that led me logically to a contradiction. So there can't be a solution. And that's exactly what the theorem said. So I proved this indirectly. I've shown that, that the conclusion that there's no solution cannot be false. So there, must, there, there can't be a solution. And there's my QED at the end. This is a slick logical attack. G.H. Hardy, a great uh, 20th century mathematician, was thinking about this indirect proof, this proof by contradiction. And he said this, this weapon, this mathematical weapon, is a far finer gambit than any chess gambit. A chess player may offer the sacrifice of a pawn or a piece, but the mathematician offers the game. <laughs> I want to show something's true, I'll say, suppose it's false. There you go. And I give it to you. But then I show that and you think you've just won because I've conceded its falsehood. But in fact, I've got a contradiction from that. I won. So, so that's pretty good. Um, one other thing before I get to my examples of great theorems. Uh, in, in logic, there's a, such a thing as a statement in the converse. And mathematicians are keenly aware of this. A statement has this st structure, if A, then B if something that's something. The converse uh, reverses the hypothesis and conclusion. If B, then A. And these are like logical cousins. And so if you're proving a theorem in mathematics, you then will ask yourself, oh, I wonder about if the converse is true. And you can check it. And if it is, that's kind of neat. You get a, that's called an if and only of statement. Right? Um, well, it turns out the statement can be true, and maybe the converse is true. So they might both hold. But they needn't both hold. And this is an important point of logic. But let me just show you a case where the statement is true and so is the converse. And here I will pick my example from the realm of geography. OK, so my theorem is this. If I am atop Mount Everest, then I am at the highest place on Earth. True. Right. Okay. What's the converse? You in, replace hypothesis and conclusion. It would say, if I am at the highest place on Earth, then I'm atop Mount Everest. Well, yeah, if I'm at the highest place on Earth, I'm atop Mount Everest. So there's a case where it goes both ways. The theorem, if A, then B, if B, then A. That's great. But the converse of a theorem need not be true. And this is something that politicians would do well to learn. <laughs> Sometimes you want to show something and you, you, you know, assert the converse is true, which does not guarantee that the theorem is. If you want to prove the converse, that's a whole separate problem. You have to do a whole separate theorem to do it the other direction. And to give you an example of a theorem that's true but a converse that isn't, I'm going to take an example from the world of pets. So theorem, if Fido is a dog, then Fido is a mammal. Sure, right, so nice Fido. Okay. The converse of this would say, if Fido is a mammal, then Fido is a dog. Is that true? No, that's false. Fido might be a wombat, right? So he's not a dog. It's a strangely named wombat, perhaps. But it doesn't have to be that the converse follows. So if you're going to prove a converse, you got to start from scratch and do it as a separate entity. And that's a logical issue for mathematicians. OK, I'm going to show you, I'm just telling you about, no, no th proof here, no logic here, but just give you the story of three of my favorite great theorems. And the first one does require one term, which I just want to remind you of, a prime number. So now we're talking about whole numbers again. It's a number greater than one, or greater than two, greater than or equal to two. Uh, that can be divided evenly only by one in itself. The prime numbers are really important in the theory of numbers. So five is a prime number. What, what divides evenly into five? One does, because one divides evenly into everything. Five does, because any number is divisible by itself. But there's no intermediate size divisor. Two doesn't go into five evenly. Three doesn't. Four. So that's a prime. Seven is a prime. What divides into seven? One and seven. Six. No, because it's divisible by an intermediate size divisor, 2. 2 times 3 is 6. 12, no, 12 is divisible by 4. That's not a prime. So the primes are kind of these special numbers. And here's the first few of them, uh, 2, 3, 5, 7. 1 is not a prime. It doesn't count. It's sort of off the charts on this one. But here's the first few primes. And what's curious about these is they kind of come haphazardly. 
you'll find big gaps where there's no primes, and then you might find, you know, 11 and 13 are both primes sort of close together, and then there might be gaps again. So, so I could tell you the tenth biggest perfect square easily. You know, the perfect squares, the first one's one times one, two times two, three times three. For the perfect squares, the tenth biggest would be 100, 10 times 10. But the tenth biggest prime, there's no formula that gives you that. So they're much more complicated. Okay, so one of the questions people ask was, do you ever run out of these? Especially since they, some, they kind of start thinning out a bit you know, as you go along. So are there infinitely many of these? I know there's infinitely many squares. One times one, two times two, three times. But how about primes? So one of my favorite theorems is the proof that there are infinitely many primes. And this uh, shows up, here we are again, in Euclid's Elements, back to the Greeks, uh, Book 9, Proposition 20, where he proves this. No finite collection of primes contains them all. He gives a proof of this. It's considered, to this day, one of the great logical proofs of mathematics. So if you give me any finite batch of primes, you give me 10 primes, he'll find a prime you don't have in your, among your 10. He finds a new one. The 10 do not contain them all. If you put that into the pot, now you've got 11 primes, his theorem shows you where to find one you don't have, the 12. If you have 1,000 primes, his theorem will show you where to find one you don't have. So if you said there's finitely many primes, you know, 612,938 of them, you apply his theorem and he finds the 612,539. There's always more. It's a beautiful, beautiful proof, and it's due to this, this great Greek mathematician Euclid, whose Elements is the most successful and most influential math book ever written. It is like, it's foundational in mathematics in the same way that the Iliad is foundational in Western literature, you know, this great Greek work that nobody would argue is modern. I mean, the Iliad isn't modern, but it's indisputably great. And Euclid's Elements isn't modern math, but it is indisputably great. So much so that I should show you Euclid here. So this is, this is Euclid. Actually, I lied. Nobody knows what Euclid looked like. <laughs> this is my canonical Greek or uh, biblical or classical male, and it can be whoever I want it to be, and I want it to be Euclid. So, so there it is. So that's, that's Euclid. Now, his work has influenced mathematicians, certainly in the Greek world, in the Renaissance, Newton, Jefferson, people like that read Euclid. Somebody who liked it was Abe Lincoln. Abe was training to be a lawyer. And he realized that to be a successful lawyer, he had to be able to prove things to, his, to the jury. And so he tells us this. I left my situation in Springfield, went home to my father's house, and stayed there till I could give any proposition in the first six books of Euclid at sight. I then found out what demonstrate means and went back to my law studies. So if he could master the reasoning of Euclid, he could be a good liar. And he was a great liar. He was also the master of English prose. And people always say that when you read Lincoln, you hear the echoes of Shakespeare, which is true, and the Bible, which is true. But if you have seen Euclid, you also hear echoes of Euclid as he sets up his hypothesis and deduces his consequences. It's very Euclidean, and that work obviously um, influenced President Lincoln. Here's another endorsement of Euclid. While we're endorsing Euclid, from Russell again, he said, at the age of 11, I began Euclid with my brother as tutor. This was one of the great events of my life, as dazzling as first love. So, Bertie fell in love with Euclid, and uh, you can see why. And one more endorsement. If Euclid failed to kindle your youthful enthusiasm, then you were not born to be a scientific <laughs> thinker. And the person that said this was Einstein. So Euclid's Elements is one of the great ones. If you're interested in math and you haven't looked at it, take it out of the library and just see it. It's pretty neat. OK. Um, my second great theorem is from a couple generations later, Archimedes' determination of the surface area of a sphere. This is more sophisticated than what Euclid did. I, I should show you Archimedes. <laughs> Let's see, is that him? Yep, that's him. Right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what he looked like. Um, now, before I mention the theorem, you, you probably know of Archimedes 
because of the famous story of Archimedes in the bath, right? He, he's in the bath. He's thinking about one of his problems. He gets a solution. He says, Eureka, I have found it, and runs through the streets of Syracuse shouting out his excitement, but he forgot his toga, right? It was back at the bath. And so he's running naked through the streets of Syracuse. An absent-minded professor, an absent-minded mathematician. There have been more of those since him. Um, but this is an artist's rendition of Archimedes jumping from the bath, having the first Eureka moment right there, uh, and also inventing streaking. I think. <laughs> Um, now, here's his theorem. He proves this in 225 BC. He says this, the surface of any sphere is four times the greatest circle in it. Now, what he's talking about is a sphere, a ball, and he wants the surface area, the area, if, like if it's a basketball, how much leather is in this thing? This is very complicated because it's a three-dimensional body, but the surface is a two-dimensional measure, and it's sort of curving. How in the world do you do something like this? And he doesn't express it as a formula. They didn't have algebra in Greek times. He expresses it as what I call a little poem. You know, I should have read this in, in the poetry section. The surface of any sphere is four times the greatest circle in it. Sounds like a poem to me. Here's what he's up to. There's a sphere. We want to know how, what's the orange surface. If you start, imagine cutting through this with planes. You get little circles, and then they get bigger and bigger as you go down, and then they get smaller and smaller. The greatest circle in it would be like at the equator if this was the Earth. So slice through that and get the greatest circle. Now imagine sort of sliding that great circle out and putting it there. So that takes, slide it out and turn it up there. There's the greatest circle in it. Take another one. Take another one. Take another one. Four. It, he proves that the surface area of the sphere in three dimensions is exactly equal to those four great circles cut through the middle. It's an amazing result. It's amazing that it's true. I mean, why should it be four? Why shouldn't it be three? Or it's 2.8. or It's four. It's amazing he could prove this so long ago. And you know how he did it? He did it with a double reductio ad absurdum a double contradiction. He said, case one, suppose the surface of the sphere is more than four circles. Contradiction. He got it. That, that was out. That can't be. He says, case two, suppose the surface of the sphere is less than four circles. He got a contradiction. That's out. He says, hey, if it's not more nor less, it must be equal. And it's a double contradiction, a beautiful proof. And it's, and it's so far ahead of its time. Nowadays, you do this with calculus. And it's not a terribly hard problem, but he didn't have calculus. He was way before that. If you remember that if the radius of this sphere is r, then this circle has area pi r squared, the formula for the area of the circle. So what he has proved in our notation is the surface of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. And that is true, and it was a great theorem when it was done. Let me jump ahead. A Oh, no, I, I, I jump ahead a few years to his death. I guess maybe you know the story, maybe you don't. Archimedes died rather tragically. He was in Syracuse. The Romans were besieging the city. And had, um, Archimedes had invented various weapons to try to keep the Romans outside the gates. But eventually, the, the Syracusans let down their guard. In come the Romans, ransack the city. They come up to Archimedes, who's sitting in there proving a theorem. And the centurion says, come with me. And Archimedes said, stand back until I complete my proof. And the centurion <laughs> kills him. So Archimedes is killed while proving a theorem. It's considered the great mathematical death you know, <laughs> ever, ever since. But um, so, OK. So that's en enough for Archimedes. Now, my last great theorem is from Euler. Patrick mentioned that name. Perhaps you know him. I want to tell you a little bit about Euler. But it's an infinite series, and it comes from a challenge. Euler was an 18th century mathematician. In the late 17th, someone named Jacob Bernoulli, and if you know science, you know the name Bernoulli. He, that's a great family. He challenged the mathematical community to find the exact sum of this infinite series. Series means sum. So you add up infinitely many terms, and he wants to know what do you get. Now, if you look at this, 
1 plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth. You see what this is. Here's the perfect square. 2 times 2, you flip it over. 3 times 3, you flip it over. 4 times 4. So you're taking those perfect squares. Even 1 times 1 is a perfect square. Although if you flip that over, you still get 1. And he's adding these forever. And the question is, what is this? What, the, what does this add up to, this infinite series? And Jacob couldn't do it, and so he writes and says plaintively, if anyone finds and communicates to us that which thus far has eluded our efforts, great will be our gratitude. Please, can somebody do this? But nobody could for a generation. Well, I'll tell you what Euler discovers, but let me just make an aside here. If you haven't seen this before, you might say, wait a minute, an infinite series, if you add up infinitely many terms, mustn't you get infinity? Just by adding, you've had so many things, it's going to explode to infinity. And I will point out that an infinite series might indeed have an infinite sum. If you add them up, it goes off the charts. And if I had that, 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, if I double the number each time, 32, 64, and you did this forever, it would go off and become infinity. Okay. But an infinite series might have a finite sum. Even if you add up infinitely many terms, the idea is if they get smaller and smaller, even though there's more and more of them, you might come out with a finite answer. And here, I'll, sh I'll show you an example. Um, that. I say 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. It's the same as this, this one, except I flip everything over. And I say that is going to have a finite sum, even though it's an infinite number of terms. And the way to see that is to draw a square that's one by one, a blue square. So the total area of that thing is 1, 1 times 1. OK. Split it in half. What's the area on this side? What's this going to be? One half, yeah, it's just half. so that's a half, so I'm going to put it down there. What's left is a half on the right, but if I cut that in half, then this cor corner in the lower uh, right is a quarter, half of a half, and I add that. Up there in the top is a fourth of the whole unit, Let's cut that in half, and over there's an eighth, half of that, add on the eighth. Cut it again, add on a sixteenth, cut it again, cut it again, cut it again. If I did this forever, always taking halves, I'd be filling up that blue square, but it would not ever get outside the blue square. And so this infinite series, even though there's infinitely many terms because they're getting smaller and smaller, it's going to come out less than or equal to 1. And in fact, it comes out to equal 1, if you think about it. In the in, if you went to infinity, you'd fill up the whole thing, and you'd get that whole blue area out of this. So there's an infinite series with a finite sum. So that can happen. OK, so now here's Euler. And he's going to look at that series that Bernoulli had challenged him with. Uh, Euler was one of the greatest mathematicians in history, although not an international icon of fashion. <laughs> I don't know why he wore this. If, if, if the painter was coming over to do my portrait, I would find something else to wear, I tell you. Euler was the most prolific mathematician in history. He wrote over 25,000 pages of original work, covering all branches of mathematics. And for much of his life, he was half blind. And for part of his life, he was totally blind. And his visual problems never reduced his output. Even when blind, he was writing papers, uh, uh, unbelievably many papers. When he was blind in 1775, he wrote 50 papers that year, which is a paper a week. What he would do is he'd just come in and recite them to scribes sitting there writing furiously, you know, and he could just see this somehow in his mind's eye. And that makes him a very inspirational mathematician as well, whose physical issues did not slow him down, rather like Beethoven, right, who lost his hearing but kept writing music. Um, so Euler is, is my mathematical hero. You might know him in uh, Will Short's New York Times crossword, five letters, Swiss mathematician. If you ever see that, Euler, it's got three vowels, you know, so that's a good one. But the great Euler uh, looked at that infinite series of the reciprocals of the squares, one plus a fourth plus a ninth, forever and ever. Notice these are getting small, 136, you know, 149. They get smaller and smaller. So this is a finite sum to this infinite series. But Bernoulli wanted to know what is it? And the answer is that. Pi squared over 6 is what Euler proved this to be. And that has no intuitive appeal. It's completely ridiculous. What? What? Pi squared over 6? Pi? 
Pi is about circles, right? Pi R squared. Where's the circles? Why is it pi squared? Why is it pi squared over 6? This looks like a typo, <laughs> but it's right. And it's considered one of the most amazing answers, one of the most amazing theorems ever. So that's exactly right. I'll give it an exclamation point there. So, so this is Euler doing his magic. OK, so those are some of the great theorems. Now, those would take you know, a semester to understand all the details of. But just to show you, these are masterpieces. Now, at the end here, what I want to do is prove one of the greatest theorems of all, the Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to give you a proof of it and see if you can follow along. And you know, This is the proof I would tell you to take to your next door neighbor. If your neighbor comes and demands a proof of the Pythagorean theorem, you can show him this one. So remember what it is. We have a right triangle. Um, and the theorem says that the square on the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares on the other two sides. The Greeks, when they did it, they didn't think of squares like exponents. You know, they thought of squares like geometry. So, when, so that was my picture here. What they were thinking of is you've got your right triangle, and you actually put a square here on the hypotenuse, and you put squares on the, on the legs, and then their theorem meant that the green square in area in area, the area of that is equal to the sum of the gray and the blue squares. That's what they tried to prove, that the areas matched up. But we tend to just write it in shorthand. This area is c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So I'm going to show you why, why this has to be. For any right triangle, any time in history. Um, there's the triangle. Um, there's what we're trying to prove. And here, I'm going to give you a geometrical proof. So as I do this, I'm going to have to take this picture down, this little triangle, but just look at it and stare at it. That's our friend, the triangle. Uh, right triangle, side A, B, C, the hypotenuse. And so remember that. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to build two big squares whose side is A plus B. So a square that's a plus b by a plus b, and then beside it, another one exactly the same. a plus b being those two lengths there. So here they are. So on both of those squares, it's a plus b by a plus b. So they're equal, obviously, in area. On the left one, I'm going to start putting dots. They're already up here, I guess. Little dots in this fashion. On the top, I'm going to go over b units and put a dot. And then what will be left is A, because that whole thing is A plus B. So if that part's B, the other part's A. Coming down the right side, I'll do A first and then B. There's the A plus B. Over the bottom, AB, and up the left, BA. So I just sort of marked little points there along there. But notice it's A plus B by A plus B all the way around. BA, AB, AB, BA. Draw lines, vertical and horizontal. And then draw that diagonal and that diagonal. So I'm chopping up this left-hand square into these pieces. OK. Now, I'm going to say the area of the left-hand square is the sum of all the little parts. So it's going to be a squared. See it up there? The a squared up in the upper right. This piece down in the lower left is b squared. And then there's these four triangles. But look at these triangles. Look at that one, say, up in the upper left there, that guy. It's my, it's my right triangle, right? That's it. It's A, B with the right angle. So there's one. And then right below it's a second copy. And over here's a third copy. And over there's a fourth copy. So the left-hand square is A squared plus B squared plus four of my triangles. OK? So that's part one. Now store that. Now we're going to look at the right-hand the right -hand square. This time I'm going to put my marks as follows. B, A. Coming down the right, B, A. Not, not A, B, as I did here. Across there, B, A. Up there, B, A. So as I read around, it goes B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A. Connect these points. Okay. Now, look up there in the upper left. There's the A, the right angle, and the B. That's my triangle again. And so this little diagonal here is C. Remember, it was A, B, C. And so is that, and so is that, and so is that. There's these copies around here. And this thing is a square cockeyed in the middle of the big square. Uh, that takes just a tad more proof that I'm not going to do. But you can show that these two angles have to add up to 90 degrees. And this whole line is, has 180 degrees around it. So that leaves 90 at each corner. So that's a square within a square. 
So now I'm going to say that the area of the right-hand square is c squared, which is the area of the cockeyed square, plus four triangles around the outside. One, two, three, four. And they're all the copies of the original, and they're the copies over there. Okay? So by, we've sort of subdivided this, these squares. Now, if the two squares were equal initially, and I remove four triangles from each one, what's left is going to have to be equal. Equal subtracted from equals gives equal. So one, two, three, we're going to remove the triangles. Ready, set, go. What's left? C squared equals A squared plus B squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem, and that's a proof. So, so you, can, you can show this to your neighbor. And say, and then, this is sometimes called the Chinese proof, because there's evidence that the Chinese, independent of the Greeks, had stumbled upon this same idea. But there's a QED for you. So you know, that's a, that's a great theorem, and that's what mathematicians do. And mathematicians, if it's beautiful and important like that, it's really neat. Uh, a math historian named Richard Trudeau, reflecting on the Pythagorean theorem, says that when the pall of famili familiarity lifts, as it occasionally does, and I see the theorem of Pythagoras afresh, I am flabbergasted. I mean, why should it be that the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the legs? There's no obvious reason for this. But with our logic, we can demonstrate it forever. So, all right, so let me end with just a few quotations extolling mathematics here. Um, one is from Hermann Honkel, a German mathematician from the 19th century, and this is an interesting point. He says, in most sciences, one generation tears down what another has built, and what one has established, another undoes. In mathematics alone, each generation adds a new story to the old structure. Our results don't get old. They don't you know, get replaced by new technology. No, because they've been proved. And in my example, the Pythagorean theorem we proved, that is behind trigonometry. If you remember trig from high school, it's, trig is nothing but the Pythagorean theorem with angles inserted. Trigonometry gave us the sine function, S-I-N-E, the sine function. The sine function is what Euler used to prove that 1 plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth is pi squared over 6. So each story is just building on what came before, and you get these, these marvelous results. Um, it was Newton that said, if I have seen farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. You, you take the work of your predecessors, it's valid in mathematics, and you see a little further. Uh, a great line, by the way. And if you, if you want to hear, I have a story about that line. If you want to hear it, ask me. Um, about Newton's great quotation. Um, we've been doing poetry here, so I'm going to do a poem from Char Clarence Wiley. I'm not going to argue that this is of the caliber of a poet laureate, but um, see what you think. He's talking about mathematics and it, its logical beauty and its power. And Wiley says this, if then, this only I assert, and my successes are but pretty chains linking twin doubts. Yet bridges stand, and men no longer crawl in two dimensions. And such triumphs stem in no small measure from the power of this game played with the thrice attenuated shades of things has over the originals, the application of mathematics to the real world. How frail the wand, but how profound the spell. So yeah, mathematics uh, even generates a poem every now and then. <laughs> um, back to Russell. Uh, Lord Russell uh, said this about mathematics. He characterized it as knowing no compromise, no practical limitations, no barrier to the creative activity embodying the passionate aspiration after the perfect from which all great work springs. He was a adherent of the idea that mathematics is art. And in some time, some cases, he's right. And let's see, another quotation. How about that one? <laughs> oh, I don't know how that got in there. Sorry, sorry. Uh, my, my bad. My bad. Um, another quotation from Lord Russell here, and we'll end with this one. Um, as he's smoking his pipe. He's, uh, 
thinking about mathematics and says, remote from human passions, remote even from the pitiful facts of nature, the generations have gradually created an ordered cosmos where pure thought can dwell as in its natural home. Thank you. You know. Russell wrote, the good life is one inspired by love and guided by knowledge. And that, that's pretty good. Russell was quite an amazing figure. Yes, Mary. Bill, can you talk briefly about what happened in the 70s when the four-color problem proved using computers and what did that mean for the classical Yeah, so, so there was a, a problem in mathematics called the four-color theorem. It was a conjecture. It wasn't a theorem. You know, they thought it was true, but they couldn't prove it. And what it says was basically this. No matter what map you draw on a plane, you know, the United States or Europe or anything, you can color it with four colors or fewer. You never need more than four any, to avoid you know, two adjacent countries being the same color. You don't want that. But you don't need 60 colors. Any map no matter how complicated, can be done with four. That had been posed in the 19th century. Nobody could prove it. And in the 1970s, someone used a computer to prove it. But here was the, here was the, the catch. They took the big problem and broke it down into, what, 1,725 cases or something. So one of these 1,725 things had to happen. And each of them would take a human being a long time to check, but they could be sort of routinely checked. So they, that was the perfect problem for the computer. They turned on the computer and it checked the first case, yes, and it checked the second case. And all the cases checked, and this, thus the theorem was proved by a computer. Well, the mathematical community was not sure what to make of this. You know, a, an electronic machine had just confirmed a, a number of cases that would have exhausted any human being. I mean, it taken a lifetime to do this. But the computer did it. But do you accept that? Has that been proved? If silicon did it instead of carbon, you know, and if, if, um, if you can't check it, you can't go back and check the computer because it would take you a lifetime. So it was the first big theorem that was proved with computer assistance. I think most people, most mathematicians, A, do accept that as a proof, and B, would sure like to find one that you could do on paper rather than having the, the computer do it for you. But, but that wasn't the same as checking infinitely many cases. See, that's, that's the issue that even a computer can't do. This one checked finitely many that they had managed to break the problem down to. Yeah? Uh, you said to find you later for the story about the quote, but I'm wondering if you would tell it to us. All right, so, so you all know the quotation. If I have seen farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. I think that's Newton's greatest line. And I think, frankly, it's maybe the greatest line in the history of science. I mean, what a perfect story about how science and mathematics advances. One summer, for I don't know quite why, I decided to read the entire correspondence of Isaac Newton. This has been collected by Cambridge, 11 volumes. So you read from when he was a student to the end of his life. And somewhere in there, in a letter that he wrote to Robert Hooke in 1675, there is that line. If I have seen far, there it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. He was talking about Hooke's contribution, about Descartes' contribution, and he was just suggesting how much he owed to his predecessors. So that was neat. So now I knew where it was in this letter. But the, um, the reference work had a, a footnote telling you where the letter was, the actual letter. You know. And so I figured, well, it's in the British Library, of course, or it's in the Wren Library at the University of Cambridge, where Newton studied and taught. The footnote says it's in Philadelphia. 
So I think, wait a minute, this can't be right. It's supposed in the historical society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia resides the letter with Newton's greatest line in it, supposedly. So I emailed them and I said, do you have this in your collection? And they said, yeah. And I said, can I come down and see it? And they said, sure. So, you know, it's a train ride. To, it's, it's near Independence Hall, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And you go in and you go through security and you tell them what you want. And somebody goes back into the archives. And five minutes later, they came out with a folder and opened it. And there it was, the letter in Newton's own hand, still perfectly legible to Robert Hooke. And look down there and it says, if I have seen farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So this was neat, you know, to have this so close. I, I sat with it for half an hour staring at it. I rubbed my hand on it in, in the hope that if there's a DNA test 5,000 years from now, they think I collaborated with Isaac. Uh, uh, they didn't make me wear gloves either. I could just do this. So then finally, you know, I have to give it back. So I give it back and it goes back into the archives. But then the question is, how in the world did this land in Philadelphia? If you go to Britain right now, the two pound coin, I don't know if you've been to England, but they have a very nice bimetallic two pound coin. They used to have, I, 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 hold that coin thought for a minute. When they had paper money, the one pound note had Newton's picture on it. I mean, the one, the most common bill, who do you put on it? They have all these British heroes. They could have put Shakespeare or you know, Churchill or Mick Jagger or somebody. <laughs> they put Newton on the one. And so he was the most revered. He had, also, he had been warden of the mint while he was alive, so that might have given him an inside shot. But anyway, they got rid of paper money. So now Newton was gone. So on the two pound coin, along the edge, if you turn it, it says, standing on the shoulders of giants, the great line. And that's, that's the honor to their great son, Isaac Newton. But the letter in which that says that is in Philadelphia. So how did this happen? Well, I asked them and they said, there was a Philadelphia industrialist named Simon Gratz, G-R-A-T-Z. He had made a lot of money in the 19th century, and his hobby was collecting autographs, signatures. And, and he collected the signatures of every signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he has the signature of you know, Queen Elizabeth I and Cromwell and Descartes and all this, and he wanted to buy a letter with Newton's signature on it, and that's the letter he bought. And on the back, sure enough, it says, your obedient servant, Isaac Newton. And so he got his signature. But on the other side, he got a treasure. So that is in the uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania. It will remain there forever, I think. The, the Brits can complain all they want, but they're not getting it back, I don't think. <laughs> but it's kind of neat. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, who, who held that that would sell it? Yeah, Because, you know, I could easily see that in the British Library when you go in and there's that room of sort of great documents, you know, from you know, writings of Dickens to Lennon and McCartney's score lyrics, you know, that right there they would have that letter. It would be there. You can just see it, but they don't own it. I guess we have enough stuff in Britain to Right, yeah, you're right. <laughs> If you have to have the letter or the honor of having Isaac Newton as one of your countrymen, take the honor. You know, but, um, yeah. Yes? Uh, somewhere, maybe I just like blacked out for a second, but when, during the, um, the discussion of uh, Archimedes and the, uh, you know, the, the four circles, right. uh, did, did you explain how he actually arrived at that conclusion, or is that just beyond the scope of That's, the, the, the The technical details are way beyond the scope, yeah. It was, it was, but it was just using geometry, not using calculus, not using functions, not analytic geometry. None of that had been, had been invented. I did, did you, I did say that the basic structure was he proved that the surface of the sphere can be neither more nor less than the four circles, right. and hence it has to equal, which is strangely indirect, right? It's like if I wanted to show you that 2 plus 3 is 5, I would first show you that 2 plus 3 can't be more than 5, and then I would show you that 2 plus 3 can't be less than 5, and then it would have to be 5, you know. And that was the technique, he, uh, the strategy he took, because that was all he could do in, in those days. But um, if you're interested in my book, The Mathematical Universe, I have the proof. And oh. so you can, you can take and look at, look at it. That, that's an alphabet book, and that's on chapter S, which stands for sphere. So. Um, <laughs> When you, the thing about calculus, if you've, any of you have had this, you can do this as a calculus problem and you get the answer directly. 
That is, you start with something, you do a process called integration, step by step by step, and out comes the answer. Archimedes had to do it indirectly by eliminating all the other cases and getting that it was four times the greatest circle because it couldn't be more or less. And that is one of the uh, signposts as to how great calculus is. That it could take a problem. Archimedes' work covers chapters, you know, to get through all the details. And in calculus, you can do it in one page. So when this happened, people said, hey, calculus is pretty neat. It can streamline the, the thought processes. Yes? Yeah, perfect square. Well, it doesn't work for five. Okay. So let, look at nine. No, let's say nine is three times three. Suppose you take five nines. Nine plus nine plus nine plus nine plus nine is 45. That's not a perfect square. Not, there's no integer times itself that gives you 45. So that one was not a candidate. Three doesn't work. You know, um, 25 is a perfect square, but 25 plus 25 plus 25, 75 isn't. So I needed four, uh, and I needed it, you know, I mean, I made it up sort of, I knew that was going to work, so I put it up here, just so I could give you an example. And one that had not only that algebraic argument that showed it, but also the geometric argument. Now, if you took nine, can you see that? If you took nine M's, you could build perfect square, perfect square, perfect square, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you'd get it. So there's another theorem. If M is a perfect square, so is M plus M plus M plus M, nine times but not eight times, yeah, so. Yes? My recollection is that the first computer was developed at the University of Pennsylvania in the late 40s, early 50s. My question is, what role did mathematics play in the development of that computer and then going forward to our iPhone? <laughs> yeah, so the people down at Penn claim ENIAC was the first computer. There is some uh, uh, the controversy about that. The, the Brits at, um, at Bletchley, during World War II, breaking the code, it invented something that sure looked like a programmable computer. I guess the theory of how this works, you, you can trace it back to Babbage and Ada Lovelace in the 19th century. Babbage was a mathematician. Turing worked on this sort of stuff. He was a mathematician. John von Neumann at Princeton worked on this. So there is mathematics in there. Um, it, there's sort of a logic, a sort of a logical um, Mathematics, not so much that you have to know how to do integrals or cosines or anything, but how you set up the logic, and then you have to get the switches, the, the, the physics, the, the engineering that'll mimic the logical flow. Um, so it, mathematics is in there. It's in behi behind the computers. And you know, in the, in the old days, at a college or university, the computer science courses would be taught in the math department. That's now almost not existent. They sort of split. And it has become its own field, I think. But, but at least in the origins, the big names were often mathematicians who were helping this process along. We have time for just one more question. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you.